Hey everyone, so I recently started a Substack, so I would encourage you all to go subscribe to me there if you're interested in keeping up with whatever I'm writing and whatever is on my mind. I'll be posting a lot of stuff there that won't be on YouTube just because a lot of things that I write don't really translate well into video. But today I want to read a brief article I wrote on the problem of divine hiddenness entitled Divine Hiddenness, the Dangerous Presence of God. So let's just jump right into it. According to the Bible, God sets up veils between himself and creation for the latter's protection. The problem of divine hiddenness is made considerably less problematic with this understanding. God does not always reveal himself when we ask, at least not in the way we imagine he should, because God isn't just some guy. According to the Bible, God is radiant with glory, an all-consuming fire, and as bright as glowing metal. Again. He's not just some guy. When God makes himself present, things change, and not always in a way we like. One of the reasons God is described as light is because he reveals what is hidden. He reveals the truth. This is an ontological reality. It has to do with the very nature of God as the truth. Those who have invested their being in untruth, who have untruth as the foundation of their egos, experience the revelation of truth as an extremely unpleasant occurrence. One can likely think of many situations where an uncomfortable truth about oneself has been made public, brought from the darkness of oneself and into the light of others, and this leads to a profound sense of embarrassment and shame. This shame makes one want to retreat, to hide in our rooms and lock the door. It is in this precise sense that the gates of hell are locked on the inside, as C.S. Lewis once said. These relatively minor experiences are amplified exponentially in the direct presence of he who reveals all to all, including ourselves. In the presence of God, we can no longer hide from what we truly are, and oftentimes, the last thing we want to know is what we truly are. God reveals our objective state of being, and if our subjective imagination of ourselves is in complete misalignment with the objective truth, then the truth cuts at the very core of our subjectivity. Humility is fundamentally the recognition that we are not the criteria of objectivity and that it's always possible that our subjective understanding will be proven false. God's presence and his judgment are mutually interior. God tarries in his judgment through tarrying in his coming. He leaves time for repentance. When God makes himself present, time contracts and choices become eternally significant. In the end, there are ultimately two choices, God or I. To choose damnation is to choose oneself in the face of eternal communion. To choose salvation is to choose eternal communion, to choose the truth. But what exactly is God's judgment? In essence, it is the division of the wheat from the chaff. This division occurs through God's revelation of the truth. It's not simply that God reveals himself at some arbitrary time and chooses who is worthy and who is unworthy. Rather, it is through his increasing revelation of himself that the wheat and the chaff naturally divide, and the line between the two becomes clear. Once again, this is an ontological reality given the nature of God and the nature of evil, and the problem of divine hiddenness cannot be understood without taking this into account. God doesn't arbitrarily decide whether certain people are unworthy, as Calvinists assert, but his active presence forces everyone to choose whether they will choose communion with him or withdrawal into themselves. His presence presses the question, which, while in this life and time, we do not provide an absolutely definitive answer to, and this is why there is no eternal security. Through his presence, God reveals the truth. He makes it clear what is right and what is wrong, and it is precisely this knowledge that is the basis of our choice. Throughout scripture, it's absolutely clear that our culpability for sin is directly proportional to our knowledge of good and evil. As Christ says to the Pharisees, if you were blind, you would have no sin. And as St. Peter says to the Jews after they crucified Christ, I know that you did it in ignorance. To sin without the knowledge that what one is doing is sinful is far less egregious than to sin with this knowledge, which is why we do not punish infants for disobedience, and why there is a distinction between manslaughter and first degree murder. To sin in ignorance is to attach less of one's conscious selfhood to this sin.
To sin with the knowledge that what one is doing is sinful is to make a conscious choice to turn one's will away from God's. And since salvation consists of the synergy of human and divine wills, it is to turn from the path of salvation and make oneself the chaff. The reason why the choice we must all make before the judgment seat of Christ is eternal is that it's a choice made in the direct presence of the truth, who reveals every possible piece of information that would be required to make a free and definitive choice. Damnation is the split between subjectivity and objectivity, the full schism between one's will and the will of God. God wills to be in communion with us, and the damned wish to be isolated so that all their uncomfortable truths remain in the darkness. Much has been said about the worm that does not die, which Christ says will torment the damned for eternity. I speculate that the worm is a symbol of the presence of Christ himself, as he will shine forth in the consciousness of all at the appointed time. In the final chapter of Jonah, we read that Jonah leaves the city of Nineveh and goes east. The sun is beating down on him, and God provides a leafy plant to provide shade for his head. However, the next day God sends a worm to chew the plant, exposing Jonah to the sun and the fiery east wind. Jonah is furious at God, and God then asks him a question, and the book ends without us hearing Jonah's response. As we know, the sun and fire are two of the most common symbols of God in the Bible. The worm unveils God to Jonah, who then presses the question and who ultimately unveils the fiery presence of God and presses the question? Of course, it is Jesus Christ. It seems reasonable then to understand the worm that does not die as Christ himself, who is eternally reaching out, pressing the question, and unveiling himself to the damned. However, this very unveiling is experienced as the most intense torment for the damned. They say I, but God says we, but then the damned say I again. They remain locked in this eternal and futile struggle to receive absolute independence in the face of God's inescapable presence. And with all this established, it now becomes clear why God does not simply reveal himself in his fullness whenever we ask. It's not because God delights in remaining hidden, but that he knows most people are not prepared to experience the fullness of his presence. He mercifully gives us the space and time to find him, and our journey in time reaches its end once we answer the fundamental question once and for all. God or I. Those who ask will receive. Those who open themselves to God, who call upon his name, will receive an answer. But we must be careful not to fall under the illusion that God operates how we imagine he should, and not to be so prideful as to think we know better than him. The Israelites directly witnessed God descend on Mount Sinai, and yet only a short time later they were worshipping the golden calf. Critics of Christianity often frame the problem of divine hiddenness by saying that it makes no sense for God to hide if he desires our salvation, and salvation can only occur if we acknowledge his existence. But salvation does not consist of a mere belief in God as a fact, but knowing him as a person, being wholly united to him. To be a Christian is to have made a determined answer, although still incomplete, to the fundamental question, which, as we have said, is God or I. It means to put Christ above all including, and most importantly, oneself. Through our baptism, we have been robed in glory and washed of our sins, fashioned in the likeness of Christ, and made capable of direct communion with him. Unlike Uzzah the Israelite, who accidentally touched the Ark of the Covenant and died, the direct presence of God does not destroy us. Uzzah did not die because God wrathfully struck him down for an accidental mistake, but because every son of Adam remains impure before being united to Christ, and the presence of God destroys or divides all that is impure, and death is nothing more than the division of the soul from the body. Only those who are holy can experience the holiness of God without being destroyed. Only those who have been illumined can experience the truth without fear. Only in Christ is God unveiled, not only so that we can know him as a fact, but as a person.